big developments in two cases involving Donald Trump. The New York election interference hush money case, that trial now delayed by at least 30 days for the judge to consider arguments about evidence in that case. The Southern District of New York has only now handed over more than 100,000 documents to Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg in recent weeks, with 15,000 pages turned over just today. Also today, a long-awaited ruling in the Georgia RICO case with a big decision. The judge overseeing the case against Donald Trump declining to disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis over her relationship with lead prosecutor Nathan Wade, ruling one of them must step down for the case to continue. The lead prosecutor, Nathan Wade, this afternoon taking the fall, resigning his position, quote, in the interest of democracy and, quote, to move this case forward as quickly as possible. DA Fonnie Willis immediately accepting his resignation. The judge may have shot down Trump's attempt to disqualify Willis, saying the defense failed to prove the existence of an actual conflict of interest. But he did find that their relationship does raise a, quote, significant appearance of impropriety that infects the entire, excuse me, current structure of the prosecution team. Fannie Willis, while admitting to the relationship, has denied any wrongdoing, vehemently defending herself at a hearing last month. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. So let's be clear, because you've lied in this. this, Let me tell you which one you lied in. Right here? I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth. Judge, it it is a lie. It is a lie. So Fonnie Willis stays, but some say the damage to her credibility is already done. A Washington Post associate editor saying even though the decision is technically a win for Willis, it is, quote, devastating and nothing short of humiliating for Willis. The New York Times noting this is just the beginning, with Georgia Republicans conducting their own investigation, ongoing negative headlines about Willis could influence potential jurors. Others going so far as to say that Willis should recuse herself. Here's former Mueller prosecutor Andrew Weissman on Morning Joe this morning. This is such a huge body blow, almost a fatal blow to Fonnie Willis. I think the way forward is she has to voluntarily recuse herself. I don't know that she has it in her, but I think she has to say, I'm going to appoint a a chief assistant who's going to oversee this case. Joining me now is Melissa Murray, law professor at NYU, and Renata Mariotti, former federal prosecutor in the Northern District of Illinois. My thanks to both of you for getting us started this evening. Renata, to you first. Your reaction, and let's start with the Manhattan DA's case, to the SDNY document dump that's been happening in tranches here. Trump's lawyers claiming that Alvin Bragg's office committed such egregious discovery violations that the case should actually be dismissed. What are your thoughts? Don't see a basis for a dismissal. I do think, though, what the judge did was warranted. What Alvin Bragg and his team did was warranted by saying that there has to be some delay to go through these documents. I think the real question is, why did the Southern District of New York wait so long to dump 31,000 documents and with another document dump to come uh, in this case when they could have you know, released them many months ago? I think there's a lot of questions about their judgment there, because this is, these are documents that uh, the Manhattan DA's office has been seeking for many, many months. Um, and originally, the U.S. Attorney's Office said they were not going to produce the documents. Why the sudden change of heart? Are they concerned about what might happen in, in a Trump presidency post-election? It's the sort of thing that I, that I think a lot of people are going to be asking questions about. And really, there should be some answer. Um, that's given. I really think that ultimately the U.S. Attorney's Office needs to answer questions about why they had a sudden change of heart in a way that really impacts the timeline of a case that I think the entire public is watching in the lead into this presidential election. And Melissa, to Renato's point, there will be questions asked by Judge Mershan and answers received. He's now set a hearing on March 25th. Um, And he agreed with the defense to conduct this hearing on the claimed discovery violations. That date should have been the first day of trial, frankly. What can we expect to occur at that type of hearing? 
Well, Katie, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with Renato. It feels like law school again. Renato and I were in law school, so I, this is the closest <laughs> I'll get to my lost youth. But to your point about Judge Merchan, I mean, I think, again, he's doing his level best to keep this moving and, again, to acknowledge that the fact of this document dump on a defendant is not the way that this is supposed to go. Defendants have rights in our system, even defendants like Donald Trump, and they have to be given the opportunity to consider and to review the evidence that's being brought against them or to review evidence that goes to the impeachment of witnesses that will either be brought against them or that they themselves might be bringing. And so the fact of this document dump is a real issue, and I think Judge Marchand is trying to get to the bottom of it. Is this something that happened because the Southern District of New York wasn't playing it straight? Was this something that happened with regard to the Manhattan DA's office? Were there bigger procedural questions that need to be answered going forward? And ultimately, the big question is, are these procedural fouls so profound that it is worth dismissing this case? I don't see him going as far as that. He's played it pretty straight thus far. But again, this is about making sure this defendant has all of the procedural protections to which he's entitled. Renata, let's switch gears. Let's go to the other huge news from today, which was out of Fulton County, Georgia. I'd like to get your reaction to the decision of Nathan Wade being the prosecutor who stepped down from that RICO prosecution. Was it the right decision for him to go? Well, I will say, I thought the judge's decision here was, you know, very down the middle. Uh, I think the judge played this, uh, she played this straight in the sense that he clearly found that there was no actual conflict of interest, which is the right call. Okay, that, that bar is so high that I never imagined that defendants could meet it. The judge correctly found that they didn't. I will say the judge, I think, stepped a little beyond his authority in, sa in basically saying that someone had to be removed for, from an appearance of impropriety. Um, really, that's I don't believe under Georgia law he has that authority, at least that's my understanding, uh, as a non-Georgian, uh, but talking to Georgia lawyers. That said, I will say this. The judge clearly believes that Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade were not candid on the, on the witness stand. He thinks that they misled the court. He's very concerned about it. I can understand, given the eyes that are on this case, the importance of this case, why he made the decision he did. I do think Nathan Wade also made the right decision. Ultimately, you know, I disagree with Andrew Weissman. Um, really, I don't think recusal under in Georgia can work the way he suggested. If there's recusal, I believe the entire office has to be recused. Mm -hmm. A new DA would have to be appointed, and that would essentially derail the entire prosecution. And so the only way, and I think Nathan Wade said for the sake of democracy, the only way that the elected DA, Fonnie Willis, and all, all the prosecutors working for her could work on this case and move it forward would be for him to step aside. It's a blow for the case because he knows the case, he's worked the case, others have to get up to speed, but I think it's the right choice for the team. You know, Melissa, in Georgia, an actual conflict of interest on the part of a prosecutor creates automatic disqualification under the law. But an appearance of impropriety does not create an automatic disqualification. Do you agree with Renato that Judge McAfee perhaps went a little too far when he was trying to find the happy medium that it seems like this order ended up reading as? Well, again, he said this was a tremendous lapse in judgment on her part and noted that her behavior had been unprofessional. Um, again, these are grown adults. This is not the kind of ethical conflict that you are typically very worried about with regard to a prosecutor. Usually the kind of ethical conflicts that really raise eyebrows are things where the prosecutor is having a relationship with the judge or with the defense or with a witness or with a juror, not having a relationship with another prosecutor. But I think Judge McAvee is correct that this is chum in the water as Fannie Willis prepares to bring her case to trial before a jury. Um, her name is going to be in the papers. Um, the fact that this has happened um, already makes clear that there are likely to be more scrutiny. There's likely to be more scrutiny of her going forward. That can't be great as she continues to prosecute this case before a jury of 12 Fulton County residents. Um, so in that sense, I don't think it's wrong to say that this was a lapse in judgment. The optics of this were quite poor. Whether or not it was for Judge McAfee to say so, I think is an entirely different question. And I believe Renato is right on that. 
Yeah, because there is actually a Georgia State Bar, for example, that could actually find if there was some violations of rules of professional conduct or ethical codes of conduct that governed her, Nathan Wade, and others. Footnote, Terrence Bradley, according to Judge McAfee, literally had no credibility during the course of that hearing. But, you know, Renato, there's no trial date. And, and that was an important point that Judge McAfee brought up in this ruling. He said that there was zero evidence that Wade was appointed in order for Fonnie Willis to derive a financial benefit and that it was a reason why this case ever got investigated, indicted, or currently prosecuted. Judge McAfee also found that it wasn't like Fonnie Willis wasn't trying to push this case to a resolution, right? If she only wanted to make money off of Nathan Wade's appointment, she would have tried to drag this out until the end of Kingdom Come. But the fact that we don't have a trial date, Renato, and the fact that we're now a good way into a court Q1 of 2024 with November right around the corner, does that give you some concern that maybe the Georgia bar is going to get involved now? Maybe the Georgia Republicans have already indicated their interest in investigating Fonnie Willis? Yeah, I do think she has a target on her back. Uh, I will not be surprised if she faces consequences elsewhere. Katie, the judge mentioned in his decision that there may be consequences other, uh, elsewhere, alluding to other bodies that could potentially take a look at this issue. So I do think Fonnie Willis uh, needs her own lawyers and is going to have to deal with those uh, circumstances no matter what. I also think that just that the indictment from the very beginning bit off a lot, okay? Jack Smith's indictment, in, in, in the January 6th the case, much more narrow. One defendant, very limited number of counts. There's a lot of defendants here, a, ver a very sprawling indictment, RICO, a whole lot of counts. This was already going to be a challenge to bring before the election and have a trial before the election. Now, with the, with the lead prosecutor out of the case and all of this distraction, I think even more reason to be skeptical that this case uh, ultimately proceeds to trial before the election.